Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Redefining School Programs in the Digital Age. Um, first, kicking off the 2020 NEMA Annual Conference. Um, my name is Kristen Levithan. I'm the School Programs Manager at the Connecticut Historical Society, and I'm going to be facilitating today's discussion, at least to the best of my ability. Uh, with me this morning is my colleague and friend, Rebecca Gavin, the Director of Education at the Connecticut Historical Society. Good morning, Becca. Hi, everyone. Also joining us today, um, she might win the Distance Award for attending the NEMA conference, is Tammy Mooring, the Content Provider Liaison at the Center for Interactive Learning and Collaboration, better known to a lot of us as CILC. Hi, Tammy. Hello, everyone. And last but certainly not least is Crystal Rose, the Intellectual Property and Visual, visual Outreach Man Let's try that again. Intellectual Property and Virtual Outreach Manager at Mystic Seaport Museum. Hi, Crystal. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So I know all of us, or at least many of us, would prefer to be together in person today. Um, but as we connect virtually, we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the peoples indigenous to the lands where Becca, Crystal, Tammy, and I are sitting today, the states of Connecticut and Minnesota, the Dakota, the Matabesic, the Mohegan, the Niantic, the Nipmuc, the Ojibwe, the Pawgusset, the Pequot, the Quinnipiac, the Scaticook, and the Tungsus. We wanted to start by sharing with you an outline of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we're going to start by sharing um, just a brief history of our journeys with distance learning so far. Um, and then we thought about the journalists um, five W's to sort of structure the next part of our program, which is really going to be the meat of what we're talking about today, which is how to create and maintain a successful distance learning program. Um, starting with perhaps the most important question, why? Why do it? Why is your institution pursuing distance learning? And then we're going to be thinking about who becomes involved and who needs to be involved both internally at your museum and externally. Um, we'll also look at where programs will take place and how COVID has affected that. Um, and then the part that I'm looking forward to most, we'll be talking about um, the elements that go into a high quality program. And we'll be getting a live demonstration from a museum educator at Mystic Seaport, who's going to be modeling some of those best practices. Um, and then the part that perhaps a lot of you are looking most forward to, which is um, how we all are using different types of technology to deliver our programs. Um, also a short discussion of how much to charge and how, again, how COVID has affected that. Um, and then we'll wrap up by thinking about what's next for all of us. At the bottom, you can see a, a link to a Google Doc that we've put together that has resources um, for a lot of the things that we're gonna be talking about today, including um, technology specs for um, all of the different um, items we're gonna be talking about. So hopefully that will save you um, scrambling and writing things down. Um, and you can see that link, it's a, um, a shortened link to a Google Doc and perhaps one of, um, my co-presenters could throw that into the chat so you can copy and paste that um, at your convenience. All right, so moving right along, um, we're gonna start with our journeys with distance learning. And we're gonna start with Tammy Mooring, who um, is sort of my distance learning hero anytime we have a question. <laughs> at CHS about how to do anything. Um, we call Tammy, maybe to her chagrin, but we're extremely grateful for the guidance she's given us so far. And I know that she's gonna be able to contribute a lot of um, great tips for all of us today. Well, thank you for that amazing introduction. Now I have to live up to that introduction. So thank you everyone. As I was introduced, my name is Tammy Mooring. I'm uh, from the Center for Interactive Learning Collaboration. My fancy title is Content Provider Liaison, but I'll tell you kind of what that means. But before I want to start off with talking about how I got into distance learning. So before I became um, a content provider liaison at CILC, I worked for the Minnesota Historical Society. I was an interpreter um, at their very historic sites. And then also I worked at the main museum, their history museum. 
while working there, we actually were reached out to by an outstate school. So in Minnesota, anything beyond the seven counties that is known as the metro area is considered outstate. And the state of Minnesota is quite big. It takes about eight hours for you to travel to the very tip all the way down to the very bottom. So many of those schools don't reach the history center or our main hub in the Twin Cities. It's very expensive and time consuming to do that. So an out-of-state school reached out to us and said, hey, you should really get into distance learning. You can use this technology. All you need is this big device hooked up to your TV. Because this is a long, later longer or longer time ago than the fancy technology we have now. Um, and we started looking into it. Um, we did some research, found out that we had some equipment available to us. Minnesota luckily then passed what we call a legacy land um, and our clean water land and legacy amendment, which means that in the state of Minnesota, there is an extra tax to go to things to help clean water in the state of Minnesota, um, keep our lands good for future generations and also for our cultural organizations. So organizations such as science centers and museums, zoos can apply for money to um, have advanced or new things. And one of the things that Minnesota Historical Study we decided to do was History Live, our distance learning program. Um, we targeted um, grades four through six and to help us get started, one of the things we did was reached out to the Center for Interactive Learning Collaboration, CILC, to come in and do a three-day workshop with us about how to get started and we continue to reach out to them along with working with our out-of-state schools about what would it take to meet them. So after, while I was there, I was able to help administer the programs, create the programs, deliver the programs, manage other interpreters that deliver those programs and do the scheduling at History Live. And our target, like I said, was four through six, which is our bread and butter um, when it came to Minnesota history. After working and doing that for five years, I left the Minnesota Historical Society and decided to be an in-classroom teacher for a couple of years. And then I missed working with museums. So an opportunity opened up at the Center for Interactive Learning Collaboration, CILC. And that's where I jumped on. And five years ago, I started at CILC. As my fancy name suggests, I am liaison or I am the go-to person for content providers um, to come to CILC to get started creating their distance learning program if they already have one to help improve theirs and also to go ahead and market their programs through our website and provide them with a professional learning environment that works to fit their needs. I think that covers the basics of who I am. So I'll pass it on to my next wonderful presenter. All right, turning it over to Crystal Rose at the Mystic Seaport Museum. Great, thanks for advancing the slide so I can remember who I am. <laughs> so my name is Crystal Rose and um, I have been at Mystic Seaport Museum since 2007. Um, my background is actually in collections and historic preservation. And um, about uh, in, in 2010, I actually um, took a, a different position uh, within the museum um, over in our education department and uh, served in education for about 10 years. As everyone over here in curatorial says, I went over to the dark side and it was a lot of fun. Um, I am now back on the other side, um, but looking at uh, virtual programs uh, throughout the, the whole museum. While I was in education, um, we received a grant to um, create an online learning platform for educators and students. And um, some of you might have seen or used our museum, uh, Mystic Seaport Museum for Educators website. Um, so that was one of the things that came out of the grant as well as uh, digital learning programs. So um, our digital learning programs uh, started back, uh, you know, we really started um, practicing and uh, doing those in 2012. And we actually have a very strange Minnesota connection too. But um, when we first started um, our programs, we had an intern who was from Minnesota and had uh, his mom uh, was a curriculum. This is how these like weird stories work. This is how like connections work. But uh, his mom was a curriculum uh, developer for the Pine City School District in Pine City, uh, Minnesota. And um, he hooked us up with his mom and uh, 
their school district, they were completely up for being, um, for being partners with us. And uh, we had a wonderful opportunity uh, to work with um, the school district's tech director, John Larson, who had had a lot of experience with uh, Minnesota Historical Society, probably with you, Tammy. This is all, all things come full circle, but, um, but uh, because of our connections with him, he gave us a lot of feedback. We tried things over and over and over again. We went to our neighbors here at the Mystic Aquarium who were so giving of their time and uh, invited us into their studio to look at their materials and how they do virtual programs. And um, now uh, here it is 2020 and um, it's one of the main things we're doing right now, probably like many of you. So um, my role in the virtual programs has been uh, with the experimenting, um, helping with grant writing, um, helping with the technology, doing the programs, writing and creating the programs. So, so that is my, uh, that's my little bit. Thank you. I'll turn it over to, uh, to Becca. Hi hey everyone, I'm Becca Gavin. I'm the Director of Education at Connecticut Historical Society. Um, I've had 13 years of experience in the museum field at a variety of different museums. Um, I've worked for the National Park Service, um, Historic House Museum, um, Art Museums, and then History Museums. I've been at CHS since um, 2015, so five years now. And when I first came to CHS, it was not right on the horizon to really embark on distance learning. Um, we had a very strong on-site field trip program. We also were doing outreach programs. And it was surprisingly my first museum experience with a museum that had a robust outreach program. Um, so it was really interesting to see how you could connect to kids by bringing items into their classroom and not just being bound to the museum. Um, but this was really my first experience with distance learning. So in 2017, we started to receive some funding to actually construct a studio. Um, and then we received funding to develop programs, um, both in 2019 and most recently earlier this year um, from the National Endowment for the Humanities. So receiving that funding really allowed us to jump into this experience. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that experience of getting this program up and running and also trying to figure out this path and figure out what distance learning is um, with no prior experience and leading a successful program that way. Great, well, thank you ladies. Um, so we wanna start off um, now with our journalists questions. And the first one, that I'd like us to spend some time thinking about is that question of why. Um, when I think a lot of times as museums, especially in the last six or seven months since um, the COVID pandemic has started, we kind of move forward without really having a chance to think about why we're doing something. In an ideal world, of course, you'd always start with motivation. Um, and so I was gonna ask um, Becca and our other panelists to talk a little bit about your motivation for starting a distance learning program and for expanding on it as time goes on. Great, so the idea to actually start distance learning at CHS um, did not come from me. Um, I can't take credit for that brilliant idea. Um, our previous director was really excited to um, embark on a distance learning adventure. Um, we had kind of maxed out the onsite capacity at CHS. We couldn't really accommodate any additional school groups in the building. Um, we were actually at capacity with our outreach programs as well, unless we wanted to do a significant staffing change and expand the staff. We weren't in the position at that point to do that. So really the third horizon that he envisioned was being able to deliver programs virtually. And so that was the initial um, concept behind um, this experience. We were able to secure funding to build the studio. And once the construction, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, once that was underway, it was really trying to figure out how to do it, what to do, um, and where to really lean on people for guidance. Um, we were kind of on track to launch our distance learning programs this year, uh, which is great. And we had literally just finished the um, internet connectivity in the studio the week that we had to shut down the museum. So we were this close to getting practice in the studio before we had to actually go into our homes and leave the studio behind. Um, so really along this whole process, one of the things that we kept coming back to was trying to balance expectations um, from within the organization 
So obviously this idea came from my leadership. So how to, you know, make sure that we weren't over committing to things and really being realis realistic with our expectations. Um, so we did a lot of research to reach out to others in the community that were doing this successfully already. Um, I was able to connect with Tammy very early on and really talk through, you know, what she thought was possible for us, what we really wanted to do. Um, so after lots and lots of cold calls, lots of conversations with different organizations, we were able to really envision what could be possible at CHS, and then for me to then communicate that up my chain um, to make sure that everyone knew this is how we were going to do it and this is why we were going to do it. Um, so having clear communication was really important. Also acknowledging our tech limitations was, was really important. Um, Crystal, when she talks, she'll explain her setup. And when we actually visited Mystic Seaport, um, Kristen and I were wowed by their amazing studio and also realized that we could never do that at CHS because we don't actually have any tech support within the building. Um, so we needed to make sure to communicate to our leadership that whatever we're doing is going to be very, very simple unless you want to hire someone that's going to be our tech support. Um, my team has incredible experience with education, but this much experience with tech um, and knowing how to troubleshoot things. So coming into it with those expectations was very, very important. Um, so since COVID, our goals and expectations shifted a little bit as everyone's did. Um, so pre-COVID, it was about reaching different audiences. It was about not duplicating what we're already doing, but creating something that would be complementary. Um, that element hasn't changed. We're still viewing our distance learning programs as another one of our items to offer. Um, the problem is right now, it's the only thing we're offering. Um, so at this moment in time, it's really standing on its own. But eventually, we hope that a teacher can do an outreach program, do a distance learning program, and come to CHS for a field trip if they have tons and tons of money, which no one does. But that will hopefully be a, a dream. Um, so that was, um, that was a big shift for us, thinking about um, distance learning being our only game in town. Um, so we reached out to a lot of teachers, asked them what they needed. This past spring, we really focused on you know, getting feedback from teachers, thinking about what they wanted, but also giving them space to just get through that school year. Um, so we developed a couple of um, history in a nutshell videos, which were pre-recorded resources that teachers could watch at any moment in time. Um, they could do the accompanying lesson plans, but it didn't require a one-to-one -one connection. Um, it was really something they could do on their schedule. So we cranked those out, offered those for free, um, and then took the time to really get some feedback from teachers, do a survey, um, and really start to focus on what we could offer for our live distance learning programs when we would launch those this fall. Um, so lots of communication, lots and lots of surveys, um, and eventually started to really just focus on the behind the scenes development of the content. Um, we were very fortunate to receive a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to actually do that development work. Um, so that's really what we've been focused on. By the conclusion of the grant period, we will have developed eight distance learning programs. Um, so we're really excited for that work and appreciative of that support. Becca, I'm going to interrupt you for one moment just to mention that the survey, the um, largest survey that we did at the beginning of the summer um, is actually available in the resource link, the Google document that I mentioned before, as well as some graphs that show um, some trends among what teachers are looking for um, in this age of COVID. Perfect. Thank you. Did I hit on everything you wanted me to hit on at this moment in time? Sure. Anything, Crystal, Tammy, that we want to add to that? in terms of motivation and how to make sure um, the big wigs are on board with what we're doing. I, I'll just say that, um, just kind of echoing um, what Becca said, that while we had, um, like I initially said, we had a grant um, that allowed us to do some of the, the research and development of our digital programs, it wasn't really exactly clear in the grant what we would be making, like what these platforms were we were going to be working on and creating uh, with educators. And so, um, 
So it, it came from a bunch of different places. Um, you know, we had definitely had people in our administration that had been interested in distance learning. Um, our education team had been, and as well as our, um, our AV staff here, um, what Rebecca said about coming over to our studio of being wowed, I should mention that that entire studio was developed before we actually had virtual programs. Um, so that was already a part of the museum. And what the education department did is we came in and after doing a lot of research and trial and error, um, we did purchase um, some big pieces of equipment, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, we purchased those materials through a grant. And um, so that has enhanced the studio um, to, to also turn it into a distance learning studio. Um, a, a couple of other things I wanted to mention is that we, when we first started doing this, you know, this is way before COVID, we, we really wanted to increase our geographic reach. We wanted to be able to reach students in other states or other parts of the world um, and have them experience our programming. Um, and what we found out is that we actually ended up working mostly with Connecticut schools through grant partnerships. Um, and uh, like Becca also said, we did a lot of three-part um, connections with classes where classes in these partnership schools would experience uh, a program uh, through outreach. They might come to a field trip and then they would have a distance learning opportunity with us. So, um, so very similar. And now, um, just like Connecticut Historical post COVID, you know, we don't really have much of an option. This is, this is what we're doing. We are doing some very limited on the grounds programs here at the museum, but for the most part, very heavy in the virtual world. So thanks, Kristen. Thank you. Tammy, any words of wisdom? <laughs> um, so I'll just kind of reiterate that um, we got started the Minnesota Circle Study because of a grant and the outreach from John Larson, the same um, wonderful person that Crystal had outreach from to get us started in that out of state. Um, we were kind of in a similar situation a little bit with Crystal with our studio. Um, ours, once we received that money, it was created and set in stone. And then um, the education staff was kind of said, here you go. And our studio was kind of considered a Taj Mahal. It had the capabilities almost of a, a TV television studio and which almost we'll talk about that later on with what to have for specs It actually in some ways shoehorned us into some issues when we were developing programs at the Minnesota Historical Society. So that's something we'll address and think about. Um, and that's something we had to overcome as we were preparing those programs. But our goal was mainly to reach that four through six audience in state would get a lower price and then out of state was a additional fun um, money or anything that brought in for like, woo, look at what we got for. That's a helpful segue to our next topic, which is um, thinking about the people that are gonna become involved in your distance learning um, project. And when Becca and I were first um, sort of given the mission to develop a distance learning program at CHS, we as educators, of course, thought about the program development. Um, eventually we started thinking about, you know, the technology and who is going to deliver the programs. But as you're probably hearing in a lot of what um, my fellow panelists are talking about that there's so much other behind the scenes stuff. So the scheduling, the marketing, the tech support or lack thereof, um, but also fundraising. As I'm hearing everyone's stories again, I'm reminded of the role that grants played in a lot of our experiences um, and that they continue to um, fund us going forward. So I know a lot of us in the museum community are one woman or one man shows. Um, and so perhaps it's you who's doing all of the things that are mentioned here, um, but to the extent um, that you can get the buy-in from all the different departments at your museum, should they exist, um, it really is an area of um, programming that touches all the, um, all the departments in your museum. Um, the other point I wanted to make about program delivery, um, we were chatting the other day and Crystal mentioned that um, for anyone who has an exper uh, experience with museum education, we know that it's important to sort of be larger than life and um, be super expressive and enunciate clearly. For program delivery of distance learning, it's all of that to the nth degree. Um, and it's interesting to see that some of your best museum educators might not 
succeed with distance learning program delivery um, because it's a completely different form of interacting. A lot of the same um, skills come into play, but the way that they're conveyed is pretty different. So um, it's been sort of surprising in some ways who takes to it like a fish to water and for whom you know it's maybe not their thing. And so within your institution, all of these different people and all these different groups are gonna be involved. Um, and I'm gonna ask Tammy to talk a little bit about um, the question of audience. So externally, who, um, who are we doing these programs for? Who are we hoping um, to engage? Thank you. So one of the things I wanna show up on the screen or as Kristen is showing up is the, the um, stats from CILC. So CILC takes all of the information that we collect from the programs that are booked, what we hear from our content providers, and we analyze them quarterly and annually to kind of give a feedback of what is happening in the marketplace. Um, we have 55,000 lifetime members on CILC. We reach over 100 countries from around the world. And to kind of break it down, um, when we look at programs that are booked so that bottom right hand side, that audience, we're seeing that the biggest consumer of programming is the pre-K through five grade. So they book about 60% um, uh, of the programs on the CILC website, um, or 50%, I should say, the remaining um, 40 more percent of that is for grades six through eight and nine through 12. And then the remaining 10% is between lifelong learners and libraries with a little miscellaneous group that doesn't show up in there, but they are starting to increase, which we won't be a surprise, but those are learning pods and homeschoolers, which you can imagine, why is that increasing for the very first time in this last year? But we all know that COVID-19 has had a great influence on that. On the bottom left-hand side, it breaks down that audience and kind of the pie shapes. You can see it as a whole. So the other would be that homeschoolers, those libraries and lifelong learners and K through 12 on the right side was a breakdown of how much they're taking. And then the top for our top consuming um, areas on CILC and looking at the audience, um, New York is taking a huge amount of our programming on CILC. Um, the reason that they are a top consumer of programming is because they have a distance learning association for their entire state. So their region educational um, associations or BOCES are they called, do a strong amount of outreach to their schools and expanding. Um, Canada is a huge consumer. Um, one of our biggest consumers in Canada is actually the First Nations in the Arctic Circle. So we're looking at students that will never have the possibility of even going beyond their village, but they're able to see the world by using distance learning. And that's something that's pretty amazing when you think about who you can reach from being in your house now on behalf of your organization or even in your little studio. And then if we look also how Ohio has a huge distance learning association network and then South Carolina and Indiana have really um, done pushes not only within the school but district wide and region wide. So that's one of the big reasons we'll talk about that later on reaching those audiences and we can talk about how to reach them too. Um, but those big regions that focus on distance learning are the top ones that we'll see consuming it. Uh, you're muted, Kristen. Sorry, I wasn't saying anything interesting anyway. Um, one of the other who questions you wanna think about is who is gonna support you um, as uh, someone who's working on distance learning at your institution? Um, Becca, who's been your support network during this process? Other museums. Um, it's a very, very simple question or very simple answer. Um, so when this idea first came to me, I reached out to some different museums that I just heard about from other people as doing distance learning successfully. I think my first, um, one of my first emails I sent was to Ford Theater and the, um, the educator there was very, very welcoming, set up a Zoom call with me, which was my first time using Zoom, if you can imagine that. Um, and in our conversation, she told me, listen, you need to talk to Tammy immediately. You need to contact CILC. She will hold your hand through this entire process and you won't have to worry about a thing. Don't be intimidated by this journey. Um, so I contacted a few other museums. I spoke to the National World War II Museum and eventually Kristen and I both kind of tag teamed who we would reach out to. And there was a long list of museums that I was making calls with and, um, and talking to, and eventually reached out to Tammy and um, 
we were actually fortunate to bring Tammy to CHS as she traveled from Minnesota last year. And she was able to give a, was it a day-long training? A day-long training to staff. And I actually made an effort to encourage staff from other departments to be involved in those sessions. Um, so I had our CEO sit in on the sessions. I had our chief curator and other stakeholders throughout the museum sat in, sat in those sessions. And I found that really useful for them to hear from Tammy, who's an expert, because I am not the expert on this, um, kind of echo some of the themes that I had figured out from my other conversations. And she was really able to make them feel more confident with the direction we were taking things. So that was very, very helpful. Um, we've continued to have a great relationship. Um, Tammy, I think she is the fastest emailer I've ever encountered. I don't, I feel like I don't actually hit the send button before she's responding to me. Um, so it's a really, it's really nice to know that when I have a very um, minor tech question, Tammy can usually solve it for me. Or if I have a larger question and need additional training for my staff, she's very, um, very willing to help us, um, which is very, very helpful. It's been great having colleagues that we can actually get in the car and drive to to talk about this. Um, Kristen and I went down to Mystic Seaport, I guess, last year, maybe a year and a half ago, and we talked to Crystal and, you know, saw what direction they took things and figured out how we could do something similar but different at CHS. Um, so I've really been impressed with how open everyone is to share. I think that's one of the things that um, has been very impressive with this is any museum that you call to say, hey, I want to talk to you about distance learning, they're very excited to talk to you about it. And they want to show you their studio. They want to, um, they want to help you. Um, and that's also very um, abundantly clear in the PEC group that Tammy runs, the um, Pinnacle for Education and Collaboration Collab Collaborative. Um, so Tammy runs this group through CILC and they're, it's a great group. They talk about different issues that they're happen, having. Um, so you're instantly um, kind of in this network of other museums to talk about the same topic. Um, so I look forward to, to getting more involved with that group. I had a chance to join a PEC meeting. Well, I've attended several, but the first one I went to um, was kind of a clinical look inside people's different um, distance learning studios and uh, mobile tech setups and it was like I couldn't get enough it was like a kid with Halloween candy because we were just starting to figure out what ours was going to look like um, and it was so helpful to you know to see what other people are doing um, sometimes it feels like with this process like you're inventing the wheel but that hasn't been our experience at all that other people are very willing to show you um, what they know to the extent that they know things um, so we're going to switch to another one of our, our W's um, and to talk a little bit about where your programs will take place. Um, and when Beck and I were first imagining distance learning, we were thinking about, um, we were sort of dreaming about the awesome setup at Mystic, which does, didn't come to pass, but um, we do have a dedicated studio space, which we'll show you a little bit more of later on. Um, but, you know, the four walled room with the green screen or the green wall as we have here. Um, and here's one of our colleagues, Andrea Slater, um, you know, showing an artifact, um, sharing an object. And that's kind of where our vision started. Um, and then we realized that that's pretty limiting, right? Because we have a museum filled with artifacts, filled with different resources. Um, and so now we're exploring different ways to get out into our museum. Um, and then uh, it occurs to us that there are many of us, I'm sure, on the call today who have grounds and um, outdoor spaces that they are able to share. Um, so Crystal, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is um, an example of one of your educators in one of the buildings on your campus. Yeah. Yes, you're, you're right, Kristen. This is, um, this is Brian Kohler, who is one of our amazing museum educators and our planetarium supervisor. And he is down on the grounds. And um, I can talk about it more in a few minutes, but this is something that we have not done until um, just very recently. Um, for the whole almost decade that we've been doing distance learning programs, they've been almost completely focused um, on being in the studio. And I'll explain why um, in a few yeah. minutes. So Crystal, um, uh, I'm gonna ask you to talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit now about how 
COVID has changed that question of where um, programs uh, are being run when you don't have access to the campus. Right, yeah, so um, when uh, everything went on lockdown back last spring, um, we you know, all went home and um, because we had been already doing distance learning programs, I realized how the technology worked and I realized we can still do this. Um, from our homes. And um, we were all a little reluctant and a little hesitant at first, um, but after some experimentation and the, the beauty of green screens, um, which can be anything. I've used a baby blanket, I've used a wall, and, and, and now technology has improved so much. So for some people, you don't even need to have a green screen. But, um, but post COVID, um, before we were allowed back at the museum, this is what our distance learning programs looked like. And we were doing a lot. We were doing sometimes three and four a day, um, a mix of school and public programs. And um, as the spring went on, uh, we began reaching out to many of our, um, many of the schools that we usually worked with and offering them some version of a program that we could do um, from home that was similar to what they might have had booked as a field trip. Um, so this involved me, um, if you can see um, the, the picture on the far left under the word where, that is me in um, kind of a walk-in closet space <laughs> in my house um, with the door shut to keep my kids out of the way and off of the programming. Um, and I was able to take home um, objects from our, luckily we had created an education collection. So those are things that were used to going to outreach programs and leaving the museum. So I checked out those objects. I kept them carefully in my little closet area. And um, I, you can see that I have a webcam hooked to a little boom that I, I stole out of the studio. And it's just connected with a ponytail holder. These are all simple MacGyver ways that you can do this also. Um, and I, probably the most MacGyver situation that I think, and I, she gets like the biggest applause for um, creativity, is um, we started experimenting with doing distance learning programs during COVID with people who weren't usually involved. So um, outside of our education staff. Um, so uh, the, the pictures on the right are pictures of one of my colleagues um, in the shipyard, uh, Sarah Clement, and this is her setup of um, she did some knot tying programs for us. She did a little series on knot tying. And um, you can see in the bottom right how professional it looks and she's showing the knots. And you can see, I love that she mailed me a, emailed me a picture of what the studio setup was like for her. This is in her kitchen. She would hang her iPhone over this little piece of wood that's being held up by two kitty litter boxes. So the thing that I really want to come across in these pictures are is yes, we do have a super fancy studio. Yes, we've, uh, we're used to operating like that. But um, when push comes to shove, you can really make a lot of things work with pretty simple technology and tools. So, um, so I hope that this at least is some inspiration for those of you um, who are out there and considering and thinking, how could, how could we make this work? Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, um, I think I was gonna talk about a little bit in this slide is, is about where your audience is. Um, so, uh, you know, pre-COVID, our audience was always, almost always together. Um, it was always a group of students in a classroom on occasion, we might work with uh, like a network of senior centers. So we might have three or four senior centers on at once. Um, so so pre-COVID, that is where our audiences were. Um, during and post-COVID, um, the model changed a little bit and we had to get used to interacting with schools that where the students are all home. And so um, whereas before we had one connection, now we have, um, you know, 10 to 200 people on a connection, which means that you have to take into consideration you need another person to, you need a moderator for all programs to um, monitor the chat. Um, and just recently we did our, I did my first one last week. We are now experiencing programming where we have students at home um, on their personal computers uh, logging into the program while their classmates are also in the classroom. So uh, that was a new experience for me just last week. And I had to constantly remind myself to check in with the kids at home. Um, it's, a little, it's a little easy to get lost um, in just relying on the teacher in the classroom and that model, which is so I'm so used to. Um, and uh, so 
so anyway, that's kind of my, my little bit of experience uh, with that hybrid model. But so, so that's my answer to where the programs take place and where your audience uh, might be experiencing the programs. Thanks, Crystal. Um, so we want to uh, turn now to the question about what um, elements go into a high quality distance learning program. What can your institution offer um, that nobody else can? And Becca, do you want to talk a little bit more about that for us? Sure. Um, so that's a question that we constantly come back to as we're rapidly developing programs is why, right? Um, what are we, sorry, what? What is really the question? Um, what are we developing at CHS that the teacher can't do in their classroom and another museum can't do? Um, so one of the things we constantly come back to is using items from our collection, um, both accessioned items in the collection as well as our education collection. Um, Mystic Seaport Museum has over 500 items in their education collection that they can use for all types of programs. Um, so those are some of the images on the slide here. Um, but we're also trying to find creative ways to use items from our collection, um, both our education collection, not with 500 items, a little bit smaller than that, um, but also our museum collection of over, um, over 2 million items. So, you know, we've incorporated some videos into our programs before we show an object on the green screen. Um, so Kristen, I'll have you play the quick video if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, this is one of my colleagues in our collection storage space getting ready to show the kids um, a painting that I then in the program plop onto my green screen so that we can look a little bit closer. And this is our amazing colleague, Jen Busa, who I think is watching. I think over. she's on this call, so I'm sorry, Jen. We didn't warn you about this. I, I actually did warn her, but yes. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. And so again, the hope with this is to give people just a little bit more of a behind the scenes feel um, and something that they can't get anywhere else because this is our storage space. And again, this was shot, I think, on a cell phone. So it's not, um, you're not using really fancy technology. It's a little choppy, but it works. It does the trick. Um, so again, thinking about what are you bringing to the table that no one else can bring? Um, you know, we do bring a lot of items into our studio to use with our document camera. And I'll show you that. Should I show them that now, Kristen, or show it later? We'll do that later. Um, but I can bring all sorts of items into the studio. Got a powder horn here today. Um, and we can actually use a document camera to really look at it up close. Um, we've also brought in different uniforms and other clothing items. Um, I had our collections department actually stuff properly a mannequin for us, which again, just gives it a little bit, um, it just makes it look a little bit more professional. And again, once you see it on camera, you realize, oh, that didn't look great. What can we do to make it look even better? Um, so it's a lot of trial and error, but trying to use as many hands-on items, um, as many things that people can't just find in their classroom or at home. Absolutely. So I'm wondering if, um... We were sort of brainstorming the other day, different ways um, to make programs more active, right? Because kids are spending so much time in front of screens, especially right now. Um, so I'd love it if each of you would share sort of one of your favorite ways to get kids moving or actively participating in a program. And I know we're gonna see an example of that in just a couple of minutes um, when we connect um, with Mystic Seaport. Well, I can, I can go ahead and I, I'll, I can say a couple of examples. Um, uh, we, one of my favorite things that we do is we have a Scrimshaw virtual program. And if you actually look the the bottom right picture is uh, uh, the cohort, the Connecticut Teachers of the Year, maybe this was two years ago, um, participating in a virtual Scrimshaw program. So they all have, um, I'm on the screen actually making a little chip um, and all of the participants have their own chip and their own little tools. And these are packages that I mail out beforehand. Um, uh, the teachers here were actually at the museum experiencing it. And this is back when um, we were still trying to convince people, yes, you do wanna do a distance learning program with us. So we were showing them how easy it is to connect. So they're only in our conference room in this photograph, um, but that program is really fun. Um, it is a lot of work and time consuming to mail out packages to people. So 
we that's really our only program that has that. We do have lots of other programs though where um, you can gather a few simple materials around your house uh, to make something or do something in the program. So those are definitely, uh, those are some really fun ways to get people engaged. And I have, oh, sorry Tammy, you go. Oh, sorry, I was just going to hop on with what Crystal was saying that um, before it used to be that a lot of the museums I worked with or organizations, they used to package the materials, get it all ready, ship it out. One of the places we work with is a hands-on museum, so they actually send out all the ingredients for making slime um, to the little puppets, to the little cups, to the actual, you know, water and green dye and everything in a box that comes with plastic and all of that. To now more and more organizations are saying if I was trapped in a house, kind of like the MacGyver that we brought up, and I only had the supplies around me, what would a kid student be able to create um, that's easy? And also, what could they grab if they completely showed up to the, the um, presentation and didn't have anything ready to go? which happens a lot because um, teachers aren't able to necessarily communicate that directly to their students. Our parents aren't necessarily having the time to get it prepped and ready to go. So finding things that they can do during the activity that are uh, easy to access and hands on throughout. Also physical ways of getting them just to stand up and do some movement helps out tremendously. Um, one of the very first programs that I saw back at the Historical Society when we were looking at other organizations was a program from the Center for Puppetry of Arts. They talk about spiders. And one of the things they talk about is spiders have two types of jaws. They have jaws that go like this, and they stab and then jaws that go like dish and they pinch. And they had a group of students still, you know, poking away, going back and forth. And to this day, as you can see, I know how a jaw, spider's jaw works. My kids walk around and even talk about that when we're at the museum. Mom, does it do dish, you think, or dish? So it worked. It had me think, think about that through. Um, when I worked at the Historical Society, we had a program about logging. We used the artifacts that students would not have access to because they're start items they want to have the ability to see uh, a saw that you would use um, because of the blade edges were out there and access they wouldn't have access to we were able to show those up on the screen um, and one of the things that we actually had students do was have a student become a tree then two other students act like they cut them down with a yardstick in the classroom that student would fall down they would be able to grab that student's leg and then pull them out of the forest, which was their classroom and into the hallway um, through a process. And it was a surprising way of them. They didn't know what part, um, part of the logging camp um, they had. They just weren't given a little card and then on the back they flipped it over and it kind of gave them a little bit of description about what their job was, how much they were paid and all that. And that usually became a kicker. Um, and then the best part is those cards with that information the teacher was able to use throughout the rest of the curriculum to talk about the importance of who had more money or power within an organization. Um, the biggest thing that was uh, came across as surprising to the students was the cook is the second highest person paid in the logging operation um, because food is very important. So that, after that, usually that kid is like, I'm really important. Mm -hmm. And they got to kind of uh, puff their chest out and be like, but those are fun ways of getting them physically involved. And one of the things that we really stress now that um, attention spans have kind of dropped almost by 15 minutes or more for some programs. It's really hard if you can get them physically involved in a way. So Crystal, I'd love to ask you to um, introduce our next segment, which I think is going to demonstrate some of the things we were just talking about. Yes. So, um, at Mystic Seaport Museum, we have a pretty active and amazing role player program. And um, we happen to have a wonderful museum educator on staff, Natasha Pazbilski, who is um, also a role player. And uh, Natasha works very hard to create um, her character. I should say, Natasha's character's name is uh, Ina Belova. Uh, and that is uh, Ina that you're seeing in this photograph here. Um, Natasha is Russian. So this was actually a pretty, um, uh, this was a really meaningful experience for her to create this particular character. Um, and she did a lot of research. She did a lot of travel. Um, and uh, actually got some, a grant to travel um, to Alaska to help put together this character. Um, she's collected artifacts that are an important part of who the character is. And um, a long story short, she's a Russian immigrant to the United States. Um, 
living in New London, Connecticut, but uh, lived in Alaska once um, she um, came from Russia. So she talks with students in person and virtually about her experiences in Russia, her experiences in Alaska, her experiences traveling and um, uh, especially by water and uh, coming to new places. And um, she does a pretty amazing job. I've seen some really incredible connections uh, that Natasha has created with students um, by just asking them things that they relate to. Have you ever moved before? What did that feel like? So she gets the students talking. You guys are gonna experience a very short um, segment of Natasha's program today, which I think is pretty fun. And it is one of those ways that we get students up and active. So um, Natasha, I'm, I'm sorry, Inna, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, Ina, it's so nice to see you. Um, so could you, and, and I'm gonna ask my colleagues that are here on the panel with me to please, you know, take yourself off mute and feel free to answer any of the questions that Ina presents and feel free to participate in any activity that she might um, guide us in today. Ina, how are you? It's lovely to see you. It's wonderful to be here and it's good to see you all as well. Uh, Ina, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and I, I, and I, you know, you can take just a couple of moments to do that, but I know you know what we really are here for. All right, that sounds good. Um, so uh, to tell you a, a little bit about myself, um, I was born in St. Petersburg and uh, my father is a missionary. And so we had to travel uh, to Sitka, which is in Russian America. You might call it the Russian, the American, the Alaskan territories. And so when I was very young, we traveled all the way across uh, by many different means. Uh, and once we got to the Pacific Ocean, I saw the largest body of water I've ever seen in my life. And we took a boat and we traveled in the North Pacific. Uh, and it was a horrible trip. Uh, it's very cold up there, but we eventually arrived in Sitka. And if you don't know anything about the territory, it's very far south. And so it's a very mild climate. And I grew up there and spent most of my life in Sitka. And in the year 1867, uh, Alaska was purchased by the United States. And those who lived there had the choice of either staying uh, or leaving. They were given citizenship. And many of my friends traveled back to Russia. Some went to some of uh, the new states uh, and some of the new territories in America, like California. And I stayed for some time with my husband and my children, but eventually I ended up um, immigrating as well. And my husband was from New London, Connecticut. And so we traveled once again by boat uh, all the way down uh, near Panama. And we traveled across the isthmus by a newfound way of travel called a train, which I'd never been on. And we, then we traveled once again on a boat all the way up to New York. And, um, and so and I've lived here now in New London for about six years. And uh, I spend my day with my children. And all right, now I'm in a building called the Sailor's Reading Room. Uh, and I spend some time in here as well. But I know that uh, Crystal had spoken to me about sharing some of the things um, that I talk about when I have visitors like you and some of the items that I share. Um, and I did bring a basket with me and I will share one art item that I, I love very much. Uh, and hopefully you'll have a chance to see it as well. So hopefully you'll be able to see, this is an egg that was given to me by my grandmother or in Russian, we call it babushka. And she painted this for me uh, as a memorial to about my family. I have no photograph of, of them, but she did. You can see this is my family right here. And uh, if I move a little bit farther this way, you'll get to see my home as well. And so when I traveled, this was one of the things I wanted to bring with me. Uh, it meant a lot to me to have this with me and to kind of uh, remember some of the people that I may never see again. Uh, so I will... So that's one of the things I carry with me. Uh, and to really <laughs> now um, do what I, I think everyone would love to see and participate in. Um, I love to teach about dancing. And for 
some of our Russian holidays, we will do a lot of singing and a lot of dancing. And so I've developed this very simple uh, dance for beginners. Uh, and if you don't know anything about Russian dancing, it's not, not a worry at all. Um, but if you don't mind participating with me, I think that would be an enjoyable thing. I don't know how long you have been sitting, uh, but it might be nice to be able to get up and move around a little bit. So um, what I'm gonna ask you all to do is from wherever you are, if you wanna stand up. Good. All right, so what we'll do is we'll do four different movements. Uh, the idea is that we'll, I'll show you how it's done and you'll mirror me. And at the end, I will sing a Russian song and we'll do all of the, all of the dances together. All right, everyone good? And Ina, I can tell people too, if um, they would like, they could um, pin you so that, um, so that they can see you as the largest screen here too. That's fine with me as well. <laughs> all right. So for the first movement, what you're gonna do is you're going to put your hands on your waist like this. And you wanna have your, your feet about shoulder width apart and give you a good center of balance. Make sure you don't have your head down. You wanna be proud that you're doing this. And all you're gonna do is on a count of one and two, you're just gonna spin one and two. It's very good, very healthy for you as well. So you'll do this. And then for your second movement, which I think everyone is doing well, you're gonna put your hands out straight like this. And you're gonna do the same thing. You're just gonna turn one and two and one and two. Very good. All right, I think we're ready to move on. So I'm going to try to do this, but my skirts are much longer than some of yours. Uh, and so I want you to be able to see my feet at the same time. So I'll say maybe if I nestle it a little bit, it'll help. So what you're going to do is you're going to turn and then kick up your heel. And I have to believe that all of you are doing it because I can only see your faces, but I believe that everyone is doing it very well. All right. So we've done the three. Now the fourth one is the most difficult, but I think that we are up to the challenge. So what you're gonna do, I'm gonna turn this way so you can see my profile, but you're going to kind of, I'll pull up my skirts a little bit. You're gonna kind of kick in place like this. Very good. And if you want to, I, I can't do it because of my skirts, but if you wanna put your hands on your waist, you're more than welcome to. There we are, well done. All right, do we feel ready to go? Yes, okay. Yes. All right, so I will try very, very hard to sing loud enough to do this. Um, and we'll do the movements. Now it does speed up as we go. So listen for the beats, all right? <clears throat> Let's get into our starting position. Feet, shoulder width apart, heads up. We're gonna have a marvelous time together. All right. <clears throat> Сяду я к домалин, домалин, камая, калин, какалин, какалин, камая. Сяду я к домалин, камалин, камая, калин, какалин, какалин, камая. Сяду я к домалин, камалин, камая, калин, какалин, какалин, камая. Сяду я к домалин, камалин, камая. This is when you all applaud. <laughs> For a job well done. Huh. Huh. All right. So now if you want to, you're more than welcome to take a seat. Huh. Ina, that was excellent. Thank if you. you don't, if you don't mind, I'd like to now introduce you as Natasha Pasilski, one of our amazing museum educators. And I just, I have to give Natasha a huge shout out. She um, ran over here to the studio from doing a homeschool program put on all of her materials, all of her beautiful um, costume to participate in this. So thank you so much for, um, for giving us just a small taste of what is really such a wonderful and meaningful program um, with one of our role players. And also that was the most exercise I've had all day. So thank you for giving me a chance to exercise You're as welcome. well. And I, I don't know if this would be possible, but Dan, would it be possible to just make the um the the studio uh to make the green screen appear for a moment just so you can kind of see <laughs> what the setup is there yes so you can see that we are in the studio natasha's basket is on a little chair under the um, under the green screen and whenever it turns on uh it looks like our sailor's reading room which is not too bad 
Natasha, thank you so much. And Dan uh, in our studio working with the cameras and all the magic behind everything. Thank you as well. Thank you. So Crystal, um, I would you talk to us a little bit? Is it Thing Link or Think Link? Think Link, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, do you have a Do you have a slide for that one? I do. Let me all click right. over to it. So one of the things that I'm, I'm going to talk about now, after just experiencing a little a little segment of one of our programs, is that we try to have a lot of pre, during, and post activities that students can do um, as a part of all of our programs. Um, and some of them are a little more um, a little more thought out than others. Um, we had an awesome intern a few years ago, uh, Ryan Saglio, um, who created uh, helped us to create this um, this package of programs specifically for the Inabelaba um, role player program. So um, we used a, a, a technology. This it's free um, a free platform called ThingLink. Um, that uh, I actually learned about from a couple of teachers who were using it. And um, you can go to um, Inna's Thing Link and you can check out her basket. You can click on all the pictures to see the artifacts a little more closely. There's a couple of worksheets. You can hear her singing the song that you just uh, heard for the Russian dance. Um, so it's kind of a fun way um, to have it to keep kids get engaged before and after the program. Um, we also have um, CILC has um, on their website, if you become a member of CILC, you get places to actually put all of the things that you create. So any workshop, any worksheets that you develop, web links that you have that go along with your program, um, there are perfect places for all of those things so that educators can access those materials um, as you start to, um, to book programming. And Tammy, I don't know if you wanted to say anything else about other pre and post materials or, or, or Becca um, uh, that you guys do? I'll uh, just uh, reiterate kind of what Crystal said about um, the materials being on the CILC website. So on CILC, our database is set up that when a member comes in and looks at your programs, once they request it and you as a content provider say, yes, I can meet your needs, that website automatically it sends out what we call a program guide, which consists of all of your materials that you have um, accessible via a PDF, a Word document, or if you just have links to what is already available on your website, it comes out as one little link that they click on and then they're able to go through and see the different parts and how it affects the different parts of the programming. Um, some content providers have pro, um, materials before, during and after an event, some have them during events, some um, have, hey, here's some other items you can look at if you'd like to, but you don't necessarily need to have them available for the program. And those are things that you can access and think about how it works within your scope as you're creating those programs of what you can fulfill and need. Teachers love those materials. Some of them love them, but do not necessarily use them. Um, so you'll have to gauge based on what you know um, of your own current materials and what teachers are using on site or when you're connecting through them on your website to understand what may fit your needs. Um, sometimes just the basics are the best. You don't have to go all out. But if you do have materials that stand on their own, teachers also love that as additional things that they can take even further. So take it um, for what you can handle and spread out and use with your time management and your abilities. Crystal, before we move on, we had a question in the chat about um, an Eno question. Uh, do you know, is that a real egg or is it a, um, a wooden egg? It's a wooden egg. A wooden egg. Okay. It is. It's a wooden egg that I think um, Natasha's father actually painted, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, one other thing before we move to our next slide, I just wanted to mention Becca had talked a little bit earlier about um, a series of videos and accompanying lesson plans um, that we have at CHS. And we've tried to incorporate those as suggested pre and post program activities for our distance learning um, paid programs. So those are free and available to anyone, but um, it's a way of kind of scaffolding and layering the different work that we've done um, that's both synchronous and asynchronous. Um, and Tammy, I'm gonna ask you if you would to talk a little bit about um, maybe the elephant in the room. Uh, is distance learning going to be the big money maker for all of our institutions across New England? 
that is the elephant in the room, but still the one that people are like, so I'm going to ask the most important question of all, can I make money off of this, Tammy? They'll say when they call me or email me. Um, we have found that most organizations, um, the goal is to be able to um, provide programming and the cost of that programming be able to cover the delivery of the program. The startup of getting a studio, the technology, creating the program, that is often not paid for when you are delivering programs. Usually the goal is to break even on once you have that program ready, you launch it, and then you stay even. If we look at these um, pro, uh, stats that I have from the CILC website, uh, we see that the average price of a CILC program that is booked is around $147. And that is a program to 30 to 60 individuals for 45 minutes. 30% um, of our programs on the CILC website are free and the other 75 to 70% are paid for at that average price of 147. There are programs though that go all the way down to $65, all the way up to $400 plus, but that depends on the program. A great example of that I like to say is a $400 program is a knee surgery. So you're seeing a live knee surgery um, with the surgeon and having to connect to the hospital. So those are gonna take a little more logistics and what to cover. Um, it's also a unique experience to connect with someone who's doing that. Um, so you may charge more for that compared to if you were to charge to connect um, to a museum to go over how to create slime or something like that. Also, when we look at this money for bringing in 43,000 is our top content provider for what they brought in for the FY20 year. So we just finished it up July 1, 2019 through June 30th, 2020. To give you a perspective of that content provider's background, they have over 50 programs they are offering on the CILC website. Um, they provide a, uh, an average of two to three programs out of their studio per day. Um, and they're charging around $165 per program. So a question when people see that, they're like $43,000, perfect. That covers the cost of one person. They can deliver it and they create the programs. Question is, can you cover that capacity? Do you have the ability to have 50 programs available or a variety of programs at least to be booked enough um, do you have the staff that can cover that many programs a day, the space to cover it and the scheduling around that? Um, and then you see the next one is that there's $30,000, a $13,000 difference, it's kind of big. Um, those particular content providers provide less programming. Um, they're still hitting our bread and butter, which is really, when you look at the CILC website, that K through five, most of them are. Um, and they're averaging around 125 to $160 for the programs in between there for what they're offering. Um, those, um, some of those content providers have been around for 10 plus years. There are pinnacle award winners on CILC, which means they have 95% or above on their evaluations. Um, and teachers have, once they found them, come back to them year after year after year, which is something to really emphasize that once you do have a member or a person hooked, they are gonna to continue to put it into their curriculum year after year after year. So your return is really great. It's just figuring out how to get into that and reaching that. Um, so figure out your expectations. Also, when you're looking at technology and what you have to cover, um, as you saw with Crystal's format, she has to pay for Dan behind the scenes and her wonderful interpreter um, doing the presentation where with some other organizations, they're just paying for one individual. So what can you do based on how you set it up also determines a little bit of it. So Tammy, one question that's come up a lot, both in museum circles I'm in and also on our chat is, is it um, acceptable be, to be charging uh, people for programs, especially in the age of COVID? What do you think about that? I think it is acceptable. And honestly, as someone who used to work in a museum and who works with them on a daily basis, that is the only way you're going to survive some of your programs or keep them going in many ways. You have to 
we often have this money versus mission mindset of the money has to be either in or we have to do it all out of mission and we constantly fight with those. Um, at some point you are going to have to charge if that is not covered in some other aspect through a grant or your foundation or your board has said that that is always going to be free. I will give you a heads up that there is um, organizations that are doing it for free this year. Um, going back to a paid system is going to be an abrupt kind of jarring to a lot of teachers after that's up with. I have seen some lower the price during this time. And I also have seen some that say, we're not gonna lower our price, but this is what we're going to do. We're gonna, if you book two or three or more with us, we will give the fourth one for free or so as an incentive to say, come back, book us, even if it's your whole school we can do it for, you yourself as a schoolroom. Um, that way we continue to have those relationships and you come back to us over and over and over again. But we're also making full use of the time of my staff while I'm in the room. If you book four in a day, I'm gonna pay for that staff probably for the whole day, no matter what. I might as well get the full use out of them and you as a teacher get your full use out of our time together um, with that. So um, expect that there is going to be some pushback on lowering the price, see what you can cover. It's okay to charge. We saw at the beginning of the year, actually in the spring when we were all sent home and everyone was frazzly, that there was a lot more free programs then. Now, looking at this year, teachers are paying more for the programs as they realize this is not a three month thing. This is the long haul for the entire year. I've got to set my curriculum up, look at my classroom for the whole year and figure out how to bring normal back into where we are virtually or physically. And one of those things is providing distance learning programs to cover a field trip I wasn't going to be on or enhance the distance learning I'm currently providing to give a break from having just me talk to all day to my students on the Google Classroom or Zoom or WebEx above platform on there. So um, we have seen an increase of those going up. So there is hope out there to charge and still have it come in. Just keep in mind that um, it's gonna take a little bit also now that they, you, you forced them and got them hooked, once they go back to the normal lifestyle, um, which we all want so bad, they will hopefully continue to go back to you and use you and see how easy it was when they were doing distance learning and how easy that's gonna be in the classroom. Thank you. I'll share a quick anecdote. Um, we have a relationship with lots of different curriculum um, specialists in the state of Connecticut. And I was talking to one recently and she reminded me that school districts that have field trip budgets still have that budget line um, for this school year. And so the money is there and perhaps more of it because they're not actually paying for busing. On the other side of that, um, school districts that struggle with um, financing in general, uh, they are gonna be the ones who are perhaps looking for those discounts. And one thing that we've been lucky enough to do at CHS is work with um, the Society of the Cincinnati and the state of Connecticut, who very graciously has um, underwritten parts of some of our American Revolution programs um, for Title I school districts. So hopefully by kind of uh, scrambling and uh, jury rigging a lot of different solutions, we'll be able to continue to serve people during these unprecedented times. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Crystal um, and both Crystal and then Becca are gonna give us quick overviews of the tech setups that they work with um, at their institutions. And I'm gonna throw the link to the resource um, document up once again, because um, all of these um, specs that they're gonna be discussing are in that document. So take it away, Crystal. All right, and I'll, I'll be fairly quick here. Um, so the first thing I want to say about the technology that we use is that um, the museum has been, um, as long as we've been doing these distance programs, we've actually first started out with Skype uh, and then quickly, pretty quickly um, pivoted to using Zoom. Um, and we've been using Zoom for years. I think when we first became involved with CILC is when we first um, got our Zoom subscription. So um, we had been using it for a while when COVID struck. 
Um, after post COVID, we have um, we do use Google Classroom or we've used other programs like um, something called Blue Jeans um, by request. Um, we're not as crazy about those other platforms. We found Zoom really works the best for us. Um, but if an educator requests it and says that that's the only way they connect with us, we absolutely do it. Um, it's some of you might have experienced this. Sometimes it's a little bit hard because I'm. We usually um, are at the mercy of the teacher to send the link to us. Um, we have to ask them for a practice link to make sure that we know how all the technology works. So um, anyway, I just thought it was worth mentioning, you know, what platform we're talking about here. Um, I will say that out of about 100 um, school programs that we did last spring, only about five teachers requested to use something other than Zoom. Um, so, uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, really quickly here, I want you to see kind of the evolution of our programs at Mystic Seaport, and I, I kind of think it's funny. Um, I like to say we've gone from the simple to the high tech, back to the simple. Um, you can see on the left, um, 2012 and 2013, this is when we were ex first experimenting with programming, mostly with Minnesota, uh, the, with the Pine City School District. Um, and we were just playing around with tools that we already had. We were using iPads. Um, we were using, um, just you can see my friend Jeff there holding a webcam and I'm holding a web eyeball, a whale eyeball, much cooler than a webcam. Um, but, we're, but we're actually um, in our collections vault. That's our curator there, probably hoping I'm not about to drop something. <laughs> um, but so, so we started out really simple and we experimented with that technology. Um, we did learn pretty quickly that um, the Wi-Fi on our grounds is, was basically non-existent, especially in 2013. We're a 19 acre campus, if you're not familiar with us, um, and the Wi-Fi is not as reliable around all areas. So, um, and, and you know, you can also use um, an iPad that has, that has um, Wi-Fi capabilities, but again, signal, you know, doesn't always work with the carrier or whatever. So, um, so that's how we started. Um, after we were able to determine what we wanted, we purchased some equipment. And again, we used multiple um, funds from multiple grants to, um, to buy equipment. You can see in the middle, um, um, that is part of our ATEM television studio setup. Um, we have a wall painted green. We actually now have a portable green screen. Um, it's something that's not seen here that we actually use now is that we have a teleprompter, which is actually pretty handy. Um, we use it not necessarily to have a script for museum educators, but um, to have, um, I usually keep a bullet list of the, all the things I want to make sure I cover in the different parts of a program. So that's really helpful. Um, and we have some, some really nice cameras that actually were already part of the studio. Um, then after COVID struck, as you saw, we moved to our closets and our living rooms and all kinds of corners of the earth uh, to do virtual programming. And um, when we emerged and we came back to the museum, we decided that that might be the best way to go forward with our virtual programs. Um, I would like to say that the little piece you just witnessed with Natasha uh, in the studio is actually the first uh, in-studio virtual program that we have done since March. So um, uh, almost every single one of our programs has been through a computer, just like what we're using right now, um, with a webcam, with a second webcam hooked up to do artifact analysis. We're in our classroom, um, which is below the planetarium um, in, at our museum, uh, near the education collection so that we can access all the materials really easily. And then um, we, our museum, our museum education director, Sarah Cahill, I have to give her so much credit. She is dedicated um, to finding, to making Wi-Fi work on our grounds. And we, because um, she's felt it's really important that we especially work with those teachers that have had field trips with us previously um, to give them the tour elements of a program. So we're now offering programs that are kind of three parts which involve three people. Um, there's a person like me here on the computer uh, acting as a moderator, showing artifacts, moving through the PowerPoint and showing some pre-recorded footage. And then we also connect with, this is my this is my education director, Sarah, and my colleague, Brian, with an iPad, with handles, a light, a microphone, a wide angle lens, all that kind of stuff. And I have all those specs are in the, um, are actually, uh, they're right here. And they're in the online, um, the little portal that uh, Kristen has sent to everyone. So you can kind of see um, the very complicated on the left to the quite simple on the right, um, which is what we are using now. Rebecca? 
All right. Um, so these are some photos of our studio. Um, it is a strange space in the attic at CHS. So kind of, I'm kind of right up there. Um, Kristen, if you want to play the weird walk through the attic, um, I think everyone might just find it funny. Um, I don't honestly remember where the idea came from of putting the studio in this attic. Um, I don't know where that came from, but you kind of follow this amazing yellow brick road to the studio doors. Um, there's a weird historic elevator right next to the studio. So one of the things that was really important was um, adding some soundproofing into it, but it's really just a weird space in the attic. Um, I'm going to turn off my virtual background so you can see um, you can see the green screen for a second. And then I'm just gonna use a different camera to kind of show you where I am. Um, so green screen's behind me. My document camera is over here. So I'm sitting and I can quickly go to my, to my uh, document camera if I wanna do a close looking. Um, I have objects kind of off to the side that I can quickly um, bring in like my red coat right here. Um, I have keyboard, mouse, my remotes right here, um, and then across from me is the um, webcam and a large screen TV. Again, all the specs are, um, are in the document, but it's a very basic setup. Um, it's, not, it's not too advanced. I know someone in the chat had asked sort of why a green screen is important. Um, we like to use the green screen so you can really do close looking with different items. Um, so here I am in the middle of the Boston Massacre. Um, and so we can actually look a little bit closer at what's happening here rather than just staring consistently at the PowerPoint. I'll also say that the green screen is really handy if you are in your closet or your child's room doing a program. So it comes in handy uh, in different places. Or as I say in my husband's office with lots of mess behind me. So it's <laughs> nice to pretend I'm outside at work. Um, Becca, did you want to talk a little bit about um, our mobile solution at CHS as well? Yes. So one of the things we realized was that we couldn't actually get to our studio for several months, um, which was frustrating because all the technology was right here, not able to be used. Um, so when we received the funding from the NEH, we, um, or rather when we applied for the funding, we incorporated um, budget money for a mobile option. And we decided after consulting with Tammy and Tammy had connected me with other museums that actually have this system, um, we bought what's called the Padcaster. And it's an iPad with all sorts of bells and whistles, microphones, lights. Um, it has its own teleprompter attached and it's very, very mobile and user-friendly. So we found that this can, you know, allow us to do better pre-recorded videos from really anywhere in the building, including from a storage space, from an exhibit. Um, we can also use this for live programming. We haven't really done that yet. Um, we have some concerns about our Wi-Fi capabilities as well. Um, I think we just need to try it and do it um, to see how strong the connection is, but we should be doing that soon. And I also have incorporated, I wanted to buy a very mobile system um, with the idea that if we do have to retreat back home, that someone could actually take the Padcaster, which fits into that cute little backpack, um, and they could just take it home and have a more elaborate studio set up at their own home. So if you have $1,700, I highly recommend it. And an iPad and a smartphone. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, we have about five minutes left, and um, I hope and my fellow panelists can check on, um, I think we've addressed a lot of the questions um, in the Q&A. I will also mention that, um, once again, that resource document does have additional information, um, but I'd also invite you to add questions there if you want some clarification on anything that we mentioned. Um, I'd be happy to follow up with you um, right on the document and we can make it sort of a living, um, a li a living history, living document of different information about um, distance learning. Um, so to close, I was hoping that um, our panelists would share um, kind of what's next on the horizon. Um, we've sort of seen where we all are today. Um, what's coming next, um, what's coming next for us, Becca? 
Um, so right now we are just rapidly developing distance learning programs. Um, our NEH grant runs out or the grant period ends December 31st. So we're chugging along with developing those eight distance learning programs. Simultaneously, we're really diving into bookings. Um, so we're getting a chance to really try these programs out, see what tweaks we need to make, make those adaptations between kids being at home, kids in the classroom. Um, last week, we had the fun experience of the night before program finding out that the teacher had to quarantine. Um, so the kids are now back in their home and they had to use Google Meets. Um, so that was our first experience with Google Meets, and um, I wasn't super impressed. So I think Zoom will still be our preferred platform. Um, but we are definitely we're learning as we go and just trying to get more confident with the um, with all the possible experiences. Um, that helped actually jog my memory, and Tammy might be able to help us with this. Um, one of our um, attendees asked if we had any suggestions or resources for people who have to use Google Meets due to um, either federal restrictions or school district restrictions, do you have any um, anything that you could perhaps add to our resource document afterward that might be some tips and tricks for people who find themselves in that situation? Um, I'll definitely look out there. There are um, a great thing about Facebook is some community. So I'm part of a Zoom teaching community. There is a Google teaching community on Facebook. And there's also a Microsoft Teams um, Facebook group. Those are a group of teachers and educators like yourself, even if they're not in, you're not in the classroom and you're in the museum, where they will ask simple questions like, my student keeps on dropping off. What is the deal? Is it just their internet? Or are they hitting a button? And you'll be able to throw things out there. So I'll throw that in. Um, I do work with a lot of museums, though, that do have set structures where they have their Microsoft Teams and their Zoom presentation ready to go. And then they do create an alternative for Google because it does have some limitations. So being flexible and thinking about how you may have to adapt it and where it changes when creating that program depending on the platform or something to think about. Also, if they're forced to go Google, is it just the students or is it everyone? One of the things that you can do is have the teacher connect to the classroom with their own Zoom, and then they can share that Zoom screen over to their students on the Google. And that way the students are all together, the teachers in charge, just like if they were physically in the classroom together. And then they'll be able to kind of be the relay between you and the Zoom and you and the Google. So sometimes having two different platforms is actually in a way better than come sometimes joining in or forcing them all to come into your room with that. Thank you, Tammy. While we're with you, would you like to, um, in one minute or less, tell us what's on the horizon for you guys at CILC? So um, CILC has two big focuses. One of them is called our Community of Learning, um, where CILC provides free programming to students and teachers, no matter if they're in the classroom or at home, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 1 p.m. And you would find those programs at cilc.org slash community. We pay content providers to present that program to um, students and teachers free of charge using a wonderful um, sponsorship we have with WebEx to do that. Um, so that is one of our goal is to continue to reach. The other part is we are trying to find ways to expand and market and push teachers to think not only free and at set dates and times, but go back to our content providers, think about those areas you need support with and bring them into your distance learning resources now if you're all remote or in the classroom. So our biggest push is we know we at CILC would not be alive or be able to survive without our content providers. So we are going to push your those organizations presenting and doing distance learning as much as we can. Thank you. Okay, over to you, Crystal. Well, as simple as it is, I think that what's next for us is we're really focused on trying to improve our Wi-Fi, our Wi-Fi capabilities around the grounds. We are using a, a Verizon MiFi pack right now, which is working wonders compared to what we've done in the past. But um, that's really the big, the big push for us. Of course, we'll, we're going to continue to refine our programs and develop new programs. Um, but you know, 
we would like to have internet capabilities below decks on an 1841 whale ship and maybe one day we're going to get there um so we're trying really hard and experimenting and uh, but that's really our big push is you know trying to connect with more diverse audiences um refining our programs and uh and getting the wi-fi working around the grounds i know we're not the only museum with this problem <laughs> Well, we're definitely in the same boat, so we can relate to that. Um, I want to thank you all very much for being here today. <clears throat> Excuse me, I want to thank my fellow panelists, Becca, Tammy, and Crystal for your time, both in preparing and for um, sharing all of your knowledge today. Um, and one last uh, mention of our resource where um, we can add, we're going to add some additional information today, um, but that will give you a quick overview of a lot of the resources that we've shared. Um, thanks again, and we wish all of you um, a wonderful